Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 713. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is January 20th, 2022. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. And for those people who are new here, this is just basically a program where Kevin and George sit down in front of our webcams and we film our thoughts about the news and we talk about the news and we try and be very transparent about the news within the, the kingdom and outside the kingdom in the secular world. And we have lots of stories this week and we try to sit down twice a week and talk about these stories. This week was once a week because, well, we also live busy lives. George's schedule and my schedule didn't match up until Thursday. This would normally be our Friday program. That's just that's just life in COVID times. Uh, what? A, oh, before I get too far, please like this program on Facebook and YouTube. Share this with your family, friends, and foe. Comment in the comment section. Lots of comments uh, and corrections that go on there. And what else? Oh, share. I did that share. Whatever. Okay. George, um, right now it's a big, beautiful blue sky here. I'm looking at the palm trees right outside my property here in Florida. Wow, we have recovered from an amazing storm where for a day and a half, 36, 48 hours, we had 40 mile per hour winds, which you can feel in an RV. We had three or four inches of rain, which you can see all over uh, when I go biking, all the, the puddles and stuff like that. And we've heard okay, but you suffered a little during the storm, George. Went out to start the Mercedes yesterday afternoon. As longtime viewers know, I enjoy working on the cars, rebuilding them. Uh, and the, the E350 uh, has been one of my treasured projects and have basically been restoring the engine and the, tran the transmission and the suspension to perfection. And then I work on the cosmetics because I want to make sure it's perfect inside before I work on it outside. And I had a bit of a free time after I had to go up to the Mayo Clinic the other day and to visit a parishioner. And I had a few hours in the afternoon when I got back early. And I went out to start the car, it wouldn't start. So I went to open the trunk uh, where the battery is and I opened the trunk. The entire thing filled with water and mud. Evidently, uh, my car got flooded out and in the trunk that, not by rising water battery. yeah not by the rising water but by the sideways rain sideways well, yeah in the trunk is the sam single acquisition monitor computer the electronics for about half the car and i guess what happened was when i sat in front turned on the ignition it turned on the ignition when the battery and every half of it's in water you short out the rest of it so it uh, looks like I'm going to be total write-off because the cost to repair, to rebuild an electrical system in a Mercedes is far higher than the uh, market value of a 10, 15-year-old car. However, oh. if you want to, yeah, I know, George, you're just like, ouch, that, that's hard. Yeah. Uh, but if you want a good deal on a Mercedes, now is the time. Never, folks, never, ever, 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 ever buy a flood damage car. No. It's already starting to mildew and mold, and you'll never quite get that smell out. Yeah. And second, the damage caused by water may show up in six months in some parts of the car because it'll wick along all the electrical systems. And you say, well, the car didn't, the water wasn't up to this level. It will go up to that level. Uh, eventually, and unless you take, disassemble the car and clean it with alcohol, the water is going to be everywhere, and it's basically a write-off. So, if you have a used Mercedes you want to donate to George's cause, give us a call. No, it, it was a beautiful car. We saw it when we were there, uh, um, but that's just that's Florida weather. You know, I've only been here uh, maybe six to eight months, and we've experienced, uh, well, just last week there were a couple of tornadoes in Fort Myers. Uh, the people are suffering up and down the uh, the East Coast here with uh, frequent storms. We learned about the tornadoes a couple of weeks ago uh, that happened uh, in Georgia. It, it's just been crazy. So um, Georgia and I suffer, but we also pray for those who are suffering because of the weather elsewhere. 
let's move on to our first story. Um, and you and I talk about this frequently because we're journalists. And the, 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 the idea is first reports are always wrong. When you hear something, um, explosion, must be terrorist. Or uh, car went off road, must be ice. The first reports of the, the basics of stories are usually wrong. And I mean, 99% of the time, the first reports are wrong. So we print stories from time to time here on Anglican Inc., uh, the sister site to Anglican Scripted. And, you know, we don't know if the story is correct or not, uh, even if we print it a week later. And sometimes the story isn't corrected for two weeks. Oddly enough, some stories aren't corrected for a year or two or five or a decade or a generation later because there just aren't people to look into it or there's no interest in the story. We reported a story last year about the uh, mass graves found outside Roman Catholic schools in Canada, which were allegedly filled with the, the bodies of native Canadian indig indigenous children who were uh, going to those schools. And we put the stories up and the world reacted. And now we're learning more about that story where we can add more context, flavor, and correction. George, w tell us a little bit about what we put up and then help us with the corrections. About seven, eight months ago, we ran a story uh, we reported on reactions and responses to the allegations of mass graves of Canadian uh, First Nations children at closed residential schools in prairie states, prairie provinces. Mm -hmm. And there's an industry in Canada of self-abasement and beating oneself up over the treatment, alleged maltreatment of Indigenous peoples in the 19th, early 20th centuries. And the narrative is that this, the, the residential schools were sort of like these Oliver Twist type asylums yeah. where children were starved and beaten to death or sexually abused by monstrous uh, taskmasters. Now, I'm no doubt that there, that may have occurred in isolated incidents, but the mantra is that this is just something that we need to be shameful. Uh, akin to America's uh, history with slavery. Right. Um, that's how it's being painted. Well, an activist released a report saying that they found evidence of unmarked graves at Canadian residential schools outside Kamloops, which is in British Columbia. This was originally picked up as mass graves, and Michael Curry, the presiding bishop, made this uh, wonderful uh, uh, impassioned speech about how bad the Canadian church was a hundred years ago and how we Americans uh, don't have this problem. Well, the reason why is we killed all of our Indians while the Canadians wanted to educate theirs, but it's a different story. Yes. And so then the story was corrected. Well, it's not mass graves, it's unmarked graves. That these children, when they were beaten or starved to death, were then thrown in a grave, unmarked in the dirt, tossed over them, and that was that. And we had the Canadian Catholic Church and the Anglican Church. We had the Trudeau government all grovel and issue these apologies and promise money and reparations and this and that. Well, some people said, well, wait, this doesn't make sense. And the cancel culture of Canada, which is actually more ferocious than the United States is, kicked in. So anybody, in essence, who questioned this narrative was a racist or a monster, even to the extent that uh, one Catholic priest in Ontario, in a sermon talking about what the Catholic church schools did for the children, was removed from his parish by the bishop for basically not following the narrative. Well, Professor Jacques uh, Roulard, French-Canadian, retired history professor, published an article in the Dorchester Review uh, recently. The Dorchester Review is an intellectual journal, sort of like the New Criteria, but in Canada. And he approached this from two directions, modern and uh, ancient history. Well, history. Ca the Canadian government, the Canadian government paid churches to educate these children. And they had school inspectors go out and you were paid so much for each child. 
So if there were mass die-offs, or if you, there would be records of the premature deaths of children in the archives. These records well, don't exist. Well, hold on. No, they do have records of a few children dying. It is written down and documented, yeah. the children that did die. There's no documentation of mass deaths. And there's no evidence of mass deaths because there was an inspection system. Yeah. Yeah. And second, when these children died, they were placed in the cemetery in graves marked, and in many cases interspersed among those members of the school staff and faculty who died. So second, there were no unmarked graves. There were they could found plenty of graves for these children who had died, marked with headstones and mm -hmm. things of that nature, or or wooden crosses. So there was no historical evidence that this ever took place. Then, what's the modern evidence? Well, the person who made these claims was an activist, as I, I think I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And she said she did a ground scan of this isolated part of the school, and there might be something there, which she interpreted to be the graves of children. Seven months later, not a single body has been found. So the hysteria and hype um, that caused the cancel culture to go into full swing, it was all a lie. It, the, the, in other words, the journalists didn't do their job at the very beginning to say, okay, we need to test this claim uh, and sort of say, well, is there any evidence of this other than a woman saying, I think this blip I found on my backyard scanner is evidence that thousands of children were killed. Well, she didn't do her di di due diligence either. She should have investigated further. And if she th thought she found a mass grave, she should have contacted the authorities and had it investigated. She did not. She just went public with, oh, look what I found here. It's a mass grave of murdered uh, indigenous Canadian children. And it based on a lie. And that blew up so bad i did did not even the archbishop of canterbury comment on it i mean he, i remember he may very well yeah i remember so many comments at the time about how bad the christian church was in the 1800s and the 1900s of course this happened and you mentioned the oliver twist example you know now we find out that that whole thing was based on a false premise and not people including the person who found this blip on her uh, ground scanner didn't do their due diligence and Kevin and George have to talk about it a year later and offer correction well not only was it a lie uh, a wicked lie mm -hmm. but it also was the foundation for a widespread arson campaign against Canadian churches uh, where, th where I think the numbers three dozen churches were burnt and destroyed across Canada uh, and it wasn't by outraged First Nations people. It was by the Canadian equivalent of Antifa, uh, people who were getting back at the church at the system. They saw it by burning down the local chapel uh, on on uh, First Nations lands. Um, this is a failure, a massive failure. It's a cultural failure where the the culture allows to cancel does not allow skepticism. It's well, a journalistic it's a, failure. It's a... Skeptics, George, oh, are... The, no, skeptics are the new witches. You know, if you're a skeptic, you're a witch, and you need to be burned and put on trial. Uh, the difference here is the witches got trials. Skeptics in 2022 do not get trials. You get canceled. And that's, that's the big difference, and that's what stopped the story from being reported correctly the first time. We, we see this in the secular press in America over COVID skeptics, and not just sort of backwoods people crazed about government conspiracies, but reputable scientists, virologists. Uh, there were three scientists, one from Stanford, one from Harvard, and one from Cambridge, who wrote a letter and put out the great Barrington statement, you know, basically saying, this is not how viruses work. And they were immediately all canceled on social media that were spreading lies and th th these are the tops in their professions more professionally qualified than the people actually making the, the, the government's policies and they were cancelled no one would I mean the the, the uh, I can't 
weigh these. I have no personal way of knowing who was right and who was wrong, but I'd like to know that there's a variety of opinions out there and for yeah. me to read and try to digest and make a decision for myself. Um, so, we, well, Kevin and I had a, a recent uh, personal example of this, of uh, there's a, that upper Midwest story that's unfolding the, uh, the abuse story. Last week we reported new police charges were filed against the underlying uh, villain, uh, alleged villain in this. Well, uh, one of the uh, groups sort of agitating for uh, victims' rights has released letters from uh, three members of the ACNA's Provincial Committee looking into this, uh, saying here's what's wrong with the, the, the uh, process. And if you read it, it's a really harsh letter, slightly histrionic, a little over the top. And the thing, and I went to the ACNA, and they can't really, they're not ready yet to comment on it. They want to, off the record, I was told all sorts of things. But they've got a process that they need to follow, and if they short circuit it, they're going to ruin the process. So I haven't printed, Kevin and I haven't printed this letter to run it at the same time as uh, the full explanation response from the ACNA so that the reader can weigh these things. I, I mean, because if all, if all, well, the whole, I mean, we talked about first reports always wrong. The second idiom of a good journalist is there's two sides to every story. Yeah. And if, if we just posted that letter uh, and you're, you're right about your interpretation of the letter, uh, that would be incorrect because we're not allowing the ACNA to respond to that letter. When it's time for the ACNA to want to respond, we will post both and we'll let the, the, uh, the reader and viewer, because uh, we'll certainly talk about it here in, on, on Scripted, about that. So we're trying to cover these, these precepts of what it means to be a journalist. And we could have got the views, got the clicks. Hey, let's put this letter out and let's increase the people who come to Anglican. That's not what we do. Occasionally we have a story that does it, but we don't want to uh, falsely make that uh, ability up. Well, I'll give you a recent example, which uh, any American who follows the news even obliquely wouldn't know within the last week. This hostage situation this past weekend at a synagogue in Texas, Colleyville, Texas. The, uh, it uh, ended. What did you call it? Hostage Host situation. No, 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 no. I was reading a BBC headline, and they were detained. Oh, detainees. Detainees. Oh, I'm sorry. This detainees. Was a per oh. This was a person of color, and he does not have the ability to take hostages. He was detaining some people. What well, story this, did you uh, read? <laughs> well, this the new acronym is BIPOC, BIPOC, or BPIC. Black indigenous person, black indigenous person of color, mm -hmm. uh, took uh, a Muslim terrorist from England, from Blackburn, uh, took hostages uh, during a uh, Shabbat services at a synagogue in suburban uh, Dallas, Hollyville, mm -hmm. and there were big reports at the end of the thing. Oh, we just lost your microphone, George. Yeah. Oh, it came back. All right, you're good. FBI storms the uh, synagogue, rescues the hostages, kills the gunman, shoots the gunman. Well, that was the first story that was everywhere on Twitter. Well, then they interviewed the rabbi and the hostages. No, the FBI didn't rescue us. The gunman got distracted and he was getting more agitated and he was, it looked like he was going to do something. And so while he had his back turned, the rabbi threw a chair at him, hit him, knocked him over, and everybody ran outside. They saved themselves, and at that point, the FBI had a barricaded gunman terrorist inside the synagogue, and then the FBI killed him, which is different from storming in and rescuing him with a flash, you know, flashbangs and this and that. Uh, you know, that's a, there's a big difference between the ra the ra the rabbi saving people by hitting the terrorist over the head with a chair, and the FBI storming in and saving the uh, hostages first stories are almost always wrong absolutely uh let's move over we the fir okay that first story we covered about there being no mass graves in 
that was a good story. We're now going to hop the pond and talk about Church of England and talk about something I didn't know about. There's something called the BBC licenses and that in order to watch the BBC, you must obtain a license. Is that the story I'm getting? Is is that correct? Yes. Uh, I have to pay. Have I, to... I would have to pay to watch the BBC, which is kind of the, the equivalent to the NPR here. Um, why would I have to pay? Because you have to. <laughs> That's essentially the argument. Well, the uh, British government uh, is mulling over uh, withdrawing the BBC licensing fee. If you if you have a television, you have to pay a fee to the BBC in England and in Britain uh, to pay for the public broadcaster, and this is called the license fee, and it's expensive. Um, it's not ten dollars or ten pounds. It's when I was there in the nineties, it was over a hundred pounds, I recall. And not only that, but they spell license with two C's, so it really is a terrible intrusion. <laughs> what a uh, crock! Both in spelling <laughs> and in you basically have to subsidize the uh, left-wing broadcaster, whether you like it or not. Well, the government is talking about getting rid of it. And without fail, the Church of England have bishops rushing in to defend the BBC, saying the BBC is such a treasured national institution, we must do everything we can to save it and preserve it. You know, they talk this, the British bishops talk about this way about the National yeah. Health Service. Uh, which they worship. They talk about the BBC the same way as they worship. Do they talk about the Church of Jesus Christ, the holy, uh, one holy Catholic apostolic church? Do they talk about it? it was, no, they only reserve this level of fanaticism for the NHS, the BBC, and the institutions of the establishment. Um, ah, we're talking about, from an American perspective, mass delusions. Yes. It's as if, folks, in the United States, you had to pay a fee to CNN. You don't, it doesn't mean you watch it. It doesn't mean you agree with it. You still have to pay for it so that they can lecture you on how you're supposed to think. And the Church of England has a bishop, uh, Helen Ann Harkley, uh, who's telling you why this is a good thing. It's it, Anytime something cannot complete in the marketplace, compete in the marketplace, it's really not worth it. Yeah, it has no value, in my humble opinion. Let's talk about uh, something that uh, I've run across frequently in my 10 or 15 years here as an Anglican journalist, and that is when I meet some Orthodox people, not all Orthodox people, a very minority. They take great pride in telling me that the Orthodox Church is never divided and that there's the Russian Orthodox and the American Orthodox or the Eastern Orthodox churches are much holier and, ironically, more humble than all the other denominations that are out there. And, Kevin, you are welcome to join the Orthodox Church. And I thank them. And I'm like, do I take this opportunity to remind them about the divisions that they probably have forgotten about? No, I just thank them and move on because... I'm I'm working on the Anglican Wars, and I don't have time to reintroduce myself to the Orthodox Wars. So, now I read that we have an Orthodox flying bishop, and that now that there's tension happening on the borders of Ukraine, obviously the Orthodox Church is going to involve itself and start to divide and cause chaos within itself and show what some of the real Orthodox of old are really like George and I thought we would introduce this to our audience so that the next time a person says you know the Orthodox Church is never divided we can offer a little correction a little just a little correction George why is the tension in the Ukraine causing division in the Orthodox Church well there's always we lost your microphone the... okay it came back uh, uh, repeat what you just said there's always tension in the Ukraine, but uh, what we're talking about in this case is a few years ago uh, when Ukraine became independent, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church separated from the Russian Orthodox Church. It had been uh, part of the one but out of Moscow. Now, some Russian, some remained loyal in Ukraine to Moscow. Others joined the new 
uh, church and the ecumenical patriarch in Istanbul, Bar Bartholomew, recognized the Ukrainian church as a full independent church. The Russians have been furious about this for years. Recently, the Coptic patriarch, I'm sorry, the Greek Orthodox patriarch of Alexandria, he is the patriarch for all of Africa, of Orthodox in Africa. It's different from the Coptics, but the Greek Orthodox patriarch of all of Africa recognized the Ukraine's independence. Moscow responded by forming two dioceses in Africa and and 102 of the Alexandrian clergy joined the breakaway diocese. This is sort of a TEC versus ACNA situation, but instead of in the United States, it's now in Africa. And the arguments are, are jurisdictional. You can't have flying bishops. You can't, in other words, all the Anglican arguments, fights we had years ago, people pulling out, well, here's what Cyprian said and this and that. The Orthodox are now fighting that fight again uh, that we fought. And what's going to happen at the end? The Russians are going to do what the Russians want to do. Absolutely. <laughs> and that's, and because the Russians have a great deal more money than the church in Alexandria, they're going to be able to support these clergy. They're going to be able to build their diocese and with money expand the reach of Moscow into the African continent in orthodoxy. Well, it, I don't think ACNA <clears throat> and tech is a, a fair comparison because that was more over doctrine than jurisdiction. But the jurisdiction thing is perfect for uh, the orthodox. Yeah, to, to well, continue. if you yeah. if you listen to these angry young men with bad deep bet with big beards uh, fighting over this issue in the orthodox world, it's as much doctrinal because the Ukrainians are heretics okay. for uh, for jurisdictional reasons and for rejecting the rule of Moscow, um, as are the uh, PEC versus AC fights. Well, different that's... topic of the argument, but yeah. they both would call them theological. Uh... No, I agree. Enough there about the Orthodox War. Let's talk about the Kenya clergy war. Uh, and it's fun because you and I have wonderful friends who are uh, clergy over in Kenya. And there's some really delightful Orthodox uh, bishops there. And then there's... I don't want to say less than Orthodox. I would say less than tribal clergy over there. And uh, I thought we could talk about this uh, it, because it's GAFCON, it's Kenya, it's Africa, and it's the weirdest story. We put it on Anglican.inc in a long, long time. Let's talk about clergy wars, George. One of the things we see in the Anglican wars is the principle the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yeah. And that is not necessarily so. Uh, the, enemy, the Bishop of Mount Kenya West is an ally of Joel Waweru, the Bishop of Nairobi. They're all part of the Kukuya tribal clan in the Kenyan church world. These are the fellows that are sort of cozying up to Justin Welby. Now, in meetings of the Anglican Consultative Council, the Kenyans, Waweru and company, beat the crap out of the Americans and the Canadians on the gay issue. But they're still willing to take money from London and Trinity Wall Street, while other Canadians and the Ugandans, the Rwandans, for instance, won't take money and won't sell their votes. I'm being vulgar here. Well, you said Canadian. You said Canadian. You meant Kenyan, right? Oh, I'm sorry, Kenyan. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. Right. Uh, money from the U.S., U.K., and Canada. Yeah. Not so much from Canada. But money from the West, they're divided between whether or not the Orthodox, the, the, the African churches are divided. And so they are on the up and up. Uh, last week, we reported about Joel Waweru appearing in court for charges of sexually harassing a female priest demanding sex in exchange for giving her a good job and this and that. And Well, this week we reported on a little story that's been kicking around for years. 
um, the latest twist in it goes back to the election for Bishop of Mount Kenya West, early 2000s. Uh, the, the bishop Joseph Kagunda, I think it is, was elected bishop, and a man named Gachua was a uh, runner-up. He was an archdeacon. But they don't like each other. And they always sort of were at odds. Uh, about 2015, their disagreements sort of reached ahead where the archdeacon was summoned to the bishop's office, basically summoned, not told why, and when he arrived, he found he was being put on trial for being a homosexual. And the trial concluded he was kicked out of the church. And this, you know, was, you know, we had people who were lying, you know, who allegedly lied and this and that, and all allies of the bishop. Well, this guy sued, pointing out that the bishop did not follow the canons of the Kenyan church, did not natural justice, and he wasn't a homosexual. Well... The civil courts in Kenya, after several years of litigation, found the violent law. Yes, the bishop was just getting rid of its political enemies by lab labeling them homosexuals, then deposing them. And so the Kenyan courts awarded him back pay, and he was reinstated. But part and part of the uh, sort of negotiations were he had to prove he was homosexual. Not a not, homosexual. Not, yeah. <laughs> not a homosexual by reconciling with his wife. Because when the charges were first laid against him, his wife left him because it's such a shameful thing. She just walked out on the marriage. Well, he had six months to reconcile with his wife or find another one. They couldn't reconcile. And so since he had not divorced and remarried and had not a wife, in December of this year, the bishop suspended him yet again for failing to marry within the stipulated six months period of time. And of course, it's going to go back to the courts. And it's such an unedifying spectacle that we see uh, bad bishops, not just in America and England, but in Africa and Asia and India. Um, one of the one of the things we saw early on in the ACNA experiment was this sort of glorification and the ideals of these African bishops who were riding in on white horses to save us. Some of that was well deserved; others, not so much. Um, they may be right on issue A, but they then on issue B may be stealing, may have illegitimate children, may have girlfriends on the side, may be employing their children. <laughs> right on issues of human sexuality doesn't mean that they're godly righteous people on everything no not at all well i mean we've already complained about the press and now we're complaining about clergy and warring clergy before i get into my next story i want to give you a little background to uh journalist bias and i was uh and this is years ago uh sitting on a deck in a hotel in mabara uganda and i was there with a journalist from the bbc and we got into a discussion. He says, you don't really believe in that Noah's Ark and that Adam and Eve stuff. And he, just, he, he listed the five top uh, things he thought was wrong with uh, Judeo-Christianity and wanted to get me to be, you know, a person that says, no, I, I question whether or not that's, that's real or not. And so I, I took him through what all confessing Christians believe believe i took him through the nicene creed and i and i said y you're worried about noah's ark and stuff like that you need to be worried about me because i believe uh in the virgin birth i believe that i uh, you know this jesus died and rose again which pales in comparison you know the noah's ark pales in comparison to uh the miracle of the resurrection so please let's let's you know throw out your little uh fallacies of what you understand uh as far as the history of the church and the, and the history of judaism and talk about the main point so when i see articles about uh newspapers the cnn's the usa today's the the wall street journals that that want or washington post that want to tell the church how to believe 
and how to get with the program and join culture. I always think about the biases of, of the journalists I've run into. And here, The Guardian, a, a paper of the UK, says, you know, Church of England, it's time to get with the program. Everybody else thinks gay marriage is fine. Why can't the Church of England also find it fine as well, George? Guardian had an editorial where it was yeah. basically saying, why can't the Church of England follow the lead of the Scots and the Welsh Anglican churches and accept the uh, accept the uh, teachings of the times and back gay marriage? And it's because I think there's still a residue of Christianity in the Church of England. <laughs> uh, surprised. I'm surprised. Surprised. <laughs> I mean, to be perfectly frank, if the, if the Guardian, we all knew where the Guardian stood on this. It was nice of them to basically put it down on paper where they stand mm -hmm. on gay marriage. Um, but it's just to be extraordinary that the Guardian would think that they could dictate the doctrine and discipline of the Church of England uh, and allow culture to determine what was uh, saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's just extraordinary. Um, and it's not that, you know, it's not that they approach it in hesitancy and say, you know, well, we are not Christians ourselves, but we would like it if you did X. No, they're writing like, you need to do this to get with the British program. Um, the, the hubris of the elites in, the, in our world, in the West, uh, that you know, no argument, no need to displain, explain things, no need to do, demonstrate why this is true it's just you need to trust us because we are the elites or the guardian or dustin weldy you just need to trust us and i hate to say this friends but the trust is long after yes absolutely yeah yeah i mean and there's no two sides to any story there hasn't been in the guardian for a long time so uh, i'm sure there's no two sides to that opinion piece too all right, let's uh, finish up some stories here. I have, oh, this is my fa my favorite one because you know, I've certainly read the Bible and uh, portions of the Quran. And from what I've read, my understanding is the God of the Quran and the God in Scripture, the Torah and uh, uh, the Bible are not the same. I don't find any connection between between the two. And we put up a story on Anglica.inc that uh, uh, is about an uh, Islamic leader, uh, theologian, whatever, who says who agrees with Kevin. And if you agree with Kevin, you're going to get talked about in Anglica Unscripted. He says there's, it's silly to find uh, some Abrahamic link between us. There is none. I agree. Do you agree? One of the one of the. Absolutely, Kevin. One of the little... Uh, have you ever been stuck in traffic behind a Prius uh, that has one of these coexist stickers? Yes. Uh, with the symbols of different world religions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the God of uh, the God of the Quran is the God of the Bible, which is the God of the, the Torah, of the Old Testament. The all this Buddha, and, yeah, yeah. This and that. Well... We have a Muslim leader who's one of the chief theologians at Al-Azhar, the uh, big Egyptian uh, university theological center of uh, Sunni, if you will, moderate Islam. This is not an Islamist or a jihadist or an extremist of any sort. This is mainstream Islam saying there is no Abrahamic. You know, we have different, to do so denigrates the individual distinctive beliefs of each of the three faiths there is not a common abrahamic religion that is just got little spokes coming out of it the god of the god of the quran is not the god of the new testament and now the article was written by an arab and it reads as if it was translated almost like by google translate in english but it was it, it's the what the 
so it does take a little finesse to understand the point that the speaker is trying to make. And you can boil it down to, it's not one God, three ways of looking at him, especially between Christianity and Judaism and Islam. But let's, it's, we're not the same. Yeah. And to try to do, try to say that we are, you know, I remember when, when we started all this misadventure in Iraq and whatnot, and I remember Condoleezza Rice, then the Secretary of State, saying in Islam, God is the God of love. No, he's not. He's God of submission. Big difference. And George W. Bush saying, weighing in theologically, and poor man was raised Episcopalian, so I blame his Sunday school education, saying that, uh, yes, uh, the, the, the Arabs, the Muslims believe in Allah, and he's the same God as the God, the Father, and Jesus, and everything. No, he's not. Uh, he's not. There's no yeah. trinity in yeah. Islam. Uh, well, so, uh, just, just what are the fruits of the Spirit versus what are the fruits of Islam? And there, there's the comparison. There's, there's that distinct line. Because I don't want to be assassinated one day in, in, in the near future, I'm not going to tell you the fruits of either. You to have to look at you know Google them for yourselves. So, hmm. All right. So that's that's the talk. And George and I agree. There's no link in any way, fashion, or form. Although George, I I without naming names, I have friends who are um, evangelists over in the Middle East who do believe or tell the people they're uh, preaching to that it's the same God. You're just moving from column A to column B. You know, you're going. I'll, you're, I'll nuance that. Nuance yeah. that a bit. Okay. It the uh, sort of Anglican teaching. Cause I I just did a sermon last week on heaven and hell, oh, and the uh, Muslims <laughs> go to hell and this and that. And I used an illustration from C.S. Lewis's Narnia books about the priest of Tash in the last battle about how how some will be saved yeah. because though they did not know it, they were. In mistakenly worshiping Tash, they were actually worshiping Aslan. The point being is the Catholic Church has this uh, understanding that was articulated Vatican II and has been around Anglicanism for a long time of sort of the unknown Christ. Well, that let's, pause, let's pause while the bulldozer bodo goes by. I'm going to edit this out. What the Church teaches, Catholic Church, Anglican Church, Catholic Church. Uh, we have the, uh, the theory of the unknown Christ. Um, you can, if you look in your Bible, you know, we, we look through a glass darkly, and sometimes we worship a God that, that we call X, but who we're really obliquely worshiping Jesus Christ without the knowledge of it. And so when you're ministering to Muslims or people in that part of the world to say, no, to start off by saying, no, it's completely different. You're going straight to hell because you're absolutely wrong. No, it's to recognize the, the humanity and the journey of these people, but realize that what you truly are seeking is Jesus Christ. What you're calling Allah is a mistake and misdirection. It's not that you're joining, uh, you're moving from the Teamsters to, the, uh, uh, to another trade union, but you're moving, you're clarifying and actually seeing clearly what God, who God truly is. Mm -hmm. So the foliage and brush of Islam is being... For some reason, your, your mic cuts out every once in a while. We're going to have to work on... If people, uh, you know, George might cut, George's mic caught off for a second. Yeah, I know it does. That's just part of the technology we use because we can't afford to rent satellites to do our show. So every once in a while, uh, the, the Florida internet goes down. We had the same problem when I had uh, fiber optics uh, back in Connecticut. So it's not really to do with uh, us using cellular right now. It's more to do with just the technology isn't there uh, to have completely uninterrupted 45-minute conversations. So, you know, I, I agree. There is there is that nuance of what you're replacing uh, with the... Uh, from Islam to the Christian kingdom. Uh, final story, I think we have time. We're here at uh, 45 minutes. So yeah, we got plenty of time to talk about whom gets to choose the next Archbishop of Canterbury. Obviously something that is going to be coming up in the next couple of years. 
Uh, it's been talked about. Rowan Williams has discussed it uh, in a couple articles where he says the Archbishop of Canterbury should really be uh, in its role He, well, he kind of just said it's it's too much for a person to be the head of uh, the Anglican Communion and to be the head of the Church of England. And he thought for sure that maybe at some time in the future we can have a head of the primates be the Archbishop uh, of the primates, so to speak. So I don't know if I'm describing that really well. George, you could probably put that to better words than I just did. I'm worried about that bulldozer that just went by. <laughs> the Clergy Nomination Commission is entertaining uh, proposals to change the way they select the Archbishop of Canterbury and adding up to five non-Church of England members of the selection process with the argument this will give input from the communion into the process for the leader of the Anglican Communion. This has caused some pushback in England by people worrying that, well, the Church of England then will be captured by these crazy conservatives and this and that. Well, friends, let me tell you what really is going on from an insider's perspective. Munir and East, and what Kevin is uh, referring to, and Rowan Williams in the past, Munir and East, the former primate of Alexandria, and other leading Anglicans have said, we need to separate the Canterbury from that of the head of the Anglican Communion. The Archbishop of Canterbury should be primate of all England, and how the English choose that guy is up to them. Right. But it is offensive and a legacy of the colonialist past to have the British Prime Minister and the Queen choose the leader of the Anglican world. So we need a new way, and what Munir Nice has suggested, and Rowan Williams has hinted about, is having the primates amongst themselves select the leader of the Anglican world. Of the, the presiding archbishop, if you will, so that the Archbishop of Canterbury returns to its pre-British Empire stance of being the primate of all England rather than to have some greater role. This is very frightening to the English establishment. They've lost their empire. They've lost uh, their England as a world power, Britain as a world power, has gone down in the world greatly since the Second World War. Um, one of the few, if not only, international institutions where the English are top dog is the Anglican Communion, and they like that. To lose the role of the Archbishop of Canterbury as the head of this, this second or third largest denomination in the world after the Catholics, the Christian group, is frightening. Mm -hmm. So how do we how do we see this off? Because we have these arguments saying that you know pointing out the fallacy of having the uh, you know Margaret Thatcher picked uh, George Perry and Tony Blair picked Rowan Williams and uh, what, I forget who I forget the British Prime Minister who picked uh, Justin Welby, but there you go. Yeah. Um, how do you get around that? Well, it's by having. Uh, a deflection. If we have five people whom we choose from the Anglican world to get involved, we will have five drones who will do what the establishment wants them to do. And I can tell you, if they were going to do it tomorrow, they'd have five people. They'd have Tabo Makoba, yeah. the one left-wing African primate. They'd have the Archbishop of Hong Kong, the one who's a member of the Chinese Communist Party's governing body. Who, um, they would have Josiah Daiwa Ferron, an Anglican Consultative Council, and then they'd have a woman, uh, and then they'd have uh, perhaps an Indian, so that they have well, the uh, they... black indigenous person of color, <laughs> sex, then they'd maybe have a closeted gay man or woman, who we all know, wink, wink, but isn't out there yeah. yet. I would suggest least, a Muslim. They should have a Muslim as well, and maybe a, a Buddhist, and you know, to just include the, the whole genre of uh, the, the inhabitants of Earth. It should all be representative in who chooses the next see, Archbishop of Canterbury. Yes. But the way the establishment in London has designed the current instruments of communion is to basically nullify size mm -hmm. so that the Nigerians who, who 
a Nigerian diocese is larger than the church in Scotland and the church in Wales and whatnot uh, in terms of active communicants. Mm -hmm. uh, but they have the same weight on the international stage. But to, to nullify that, to nullify the strength of the growing African and Asian churches through uh, a system that perpetuates uh, reliance by those less wealthy, less developed provinces upon England. So provinces that basically need something from England or think they need it will always do what they're told. Those, the Nigerians and the Ugandans have figured out there's nothing the Church of England can do for them. There's nothing Great Britain can do for them except make their life miserable. Uh, they don't need the uh, system. So it's a way to, to, to prevent the Archbishop of Canterbury from being dethroned in the future and to make sure that just like we had this uh, Stephen Knott is now the head of the uh, appointment secretary he's the partnered gay man and one of the things we've learned is that there was no advertisement for the job there was no public you know search for the best person and the head of the committee that selected Stephen Knott was also a gay partnered man so you know the fix is in from the very beginning and just because someone is non-white doesn't mean that they're acceptable to the orthodox or conservative or traditional world. No, and that's true. I mean, I can think of 39 qualified individuals who would be very good at representing a, a wonderful way to pick the next head of the Anglican Communion. Okay, the primates. Uh, we don't need a, a committee of five uh, who are outside the Church of England to do it. I have a committee of 38 outside of the Anglican Community, Communion who could do a wonderful job, who are right there, who knows what the Anglican Community needs in a leader, who know because they want to work with this individual. So we'll have to see, George. Um, I, I don't hold a, a lot of hope. You and I both know if it's just these five, the fix is in. You know, mm -hmm. you know, when when they say we want to pick five outside of the Church of England, wink, 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 wink. You okay? All right, whatever. All right, George. Uh, if people can't tell, it's construction season here at the Florida Grand. You got to hear all these bulldozers go by. I hope you enjoyed that. I'd have to pay extra for it. Just part of the the ambiance. I'm Kevin Carlson, and I'm George Congren. You've been watching episode seven hundred and thirteen of Anglican on Springfield.